Hi everyone, Vicki Verley here. I'm going to do another video on some ET races that have come through in my channel material, the Transmissions for Humanity books. So some of this came through in the very first book, book one, and I'm going to read some things from that. And the other came through in this last book, book three. And this is in particular about as it relates to the Navi from the Avatar movies, right? So many people were into the Navi so much and related to it so much and thought that they were so sad they wanted to go to Pandora. And I do believe that that is from, you know, the having a previous lifetime there or another incarnation there. And uh, what I wanted to show you to start with, um, I'm going to read from the books, but like, here's the Navi, okay, on the, on the left here. I hope you guys can see this share screen, right? And so way back, like this is like maybe even the late 70s or definitely early 80s at the latest, I think even late 70s. And I took the ceramics class and I was I making these, uh, well, they're candle holders, but I was making these little statues and they're blue, okay, they're blue and they have this kind of dread-like hair sort of, you know, and look, even here, they have the, um, like that headband thing on, right? And I remember taking that ceramics class and, and the people are like, why are they blue? <laughs> and I'm just, this was like, again, this is like the 70s, maybe late 70s. So way, 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 way before the Navi ever showed up on the screens, you know? And I was like, I don't know. They just are. They're like, why are they blue? I'm like, I don't know. They just are blue. Are they? And I remember the, one of the teachers was like, you know, we have all different colored flesh tones over there in the glazes. You know, you're putting blue glaze on that. I'm like, I know it's blue. And I didn't know why, but I just, I was, I had this like compulsion almost to cut to uh, create these. And I was always drawing. Let me see if I could move me down. Maybe I'll move me down on the bottom. Can I move me down on the bottom? There we go. That'll be probably better. And, and this is a side view of that same statue. I had wings on them, right? But blue skin, the dread hair, you know, dreadish kind of hair. And then this is another one. She doesn't have the headband, but she's got the, the hair and the little wings. And then what the way I always drew them and I always, uh, you know, imagine them or whatever there's always these other little guys here these little blue headed guys with pointy heads that are they're like feel like they're connected to these other and i call them fairies but i mean they're so similar and even like they're always in nature there's a whole bunch of things that are really similar and then here's another one that's a taller one with the with the pointy head another candle holder i, I did this whole bunch of these candle holders and the people <laughs> The people in the ceramics class and the uh, and the teacher thought I was a little nuts, I think. And this is an illustration from my children's book, uh, which I carried it even a little farther. He's Blue Lou is one of the Green Glen. So here's Blue Lou Peeps, you know, that's his tribe. And in this one I have, they're always under mushrooms too. I tried to find there was this other drawing I used to draw all the time where he's kind of big under the mushroom. But then I have these pointy headed blue things like flying around. And like I said, I used to draw this like constantly. So I asked about this in the very first book, The Transmissions for Humanity, book one. I hope you can get it on camera. I guess I can't. <laughs> it's fading in and out. But, you know, you can find it. It's on Amazon. I'll put some links in. But uh, this was the first time that I asked my guides about the blue and as it relates to the avatars, too. Because the minute I saw that avatar movie, I'm like, oh, my God, those are the same. Those are the same things that. You know, I was seeing all those years, you know, it's the same. When I saw the avatar, I was like, oh, my God, that's so cool. What are the odds that two people would think of these same blue beings with the dready hair and the thing, you know, the whole thing? So here's what I wrote uh, when I asked the guides about it. And here, well, I'll tell you what they said. So here we go. Here's me. I say, I want to ask about the movie Avatar and the Navi. The Navi are so similar to the drawings and sculptures I've done in the past. When I saw that movie, I thought that he and I must be remembering the same place. Yeah, that's what it was. I've also heard stories of people crying when leaving the movie theater, wanting to go live on Pandora. Have we all had past lives there or a similar planet? Okay, so here's what they said. There are vast legions of blue skinned beings living in this and other galaxies. You have known this from your earliest years of childhood the Navi, as well as the beings from your art remembrances, are not exactly the same. They are two of several thousand such races scattered throughout the universe. Yes, many walking the earth now have incarnated in these galaxies. So they're saying no, they're not the same, and there's so many of them. 
you know, we, we have kind of a limited, narrow perspective. So then I continue, I ask them, well, James Cameron's and mine seem to have a similar vibe. They're both connection to nature, they have similar hair, and even the headpieces that they wore. And they say, yes, there is a similar experience, but that is true throughout, throughout the expanse. As we have told you already, Earth is a low vibrational place. The majority are more evolved and in harmony with the natural world, as we advise you often. Yeah, so we think that we're so involved with all our technology and all our metal and progress and everything's made out of metal and plastic. But they're saying, no, that's not true. That the more evolved species are everywhere. It's, it's on you. We're, on the, we're the exception. And that the more evolved species are very connected to nature. So that's not strange at all. That's actually the commonplace that they would be more connected with nature. And then uh, I, they continue, they say the two in question, meaning the avatar and mine, right? They say are both very peaceful societies that are close in connection to their natural environments. The third race revealed to you in your childhood are scientists, geneticists, mathematicians, and other areas of study that are beyond your earthly uh, comprehension. You have connections to both, they're telling me. So this third race, this was this other blue race. That would, they didn't look like this, so they looked like very different. They had these really long fingers. And it was this, I used to see it all the time when I was real little, and I would tell my mom about it. My mom would say, you're dreaming. <laughs> That's what she always said. You're just dreaming. I'm like, I'm not dreaming. I knew I wasn't dreaming, right? So then I'm asking, well, what about Hinduism, Shiva, and other gods? And also the blue people that live in Appalachia, the blue Fugats or Fugates, it's F-U-G-A-T-E-S, if anybody wants to look it up. Are they a remnant from the blue alien race? So I'm going to show you. Here's the Shiva, which I'm sure many are familiar with. And there's other uh, blue gods and goddesses in the Indian culture. But I have the, the famous photo of the blue Fugats or Fugates. Here it is. I mean, it, it looks painted. I mean, it looks pretty cheesy, but there's other photos that are, you can really see it. They really do have blue hue to their skin. And they live in Appalachia. And they, when I talk about them more in here, the book, they, the guides start calling them the hill people, I think. Uh, but they're up in the Appalachian mountains. And all of a sudden there's these, every now and then there's this genetic anomaly where they pop out blue people, you know? So, um, so here's what they're, let me go back to Shiva. That's because that's kind of a scary picture anyway, isn't it? Oh, of course, my little thing's going to act up my cursor. Let's go back to the thing. Thank you. Okay, so yeah. Uh, so I'm asking, well, what about that? Are they from a blue alien race as well? And they reply, yes, there is a true genetic connection with the blue Fugats. They were blue beings. There were blue beings that visited ancient India as well to support knowledge and impart the earth walkers of the time. And then they say they also visited various other parts of your ancient world. There is a genetic component connected to your Asian race that is more conductive to blue interdwelling of species. They inter intermingled among your Native American tribes. Those genetic markers are present in the hill people. That's the blue Fugats or Fugates. And then I say, well, as to the Navi, in the movie, they're connected to these trees. The tree of souls. Yeah, that was the next slide over here. So that's that beautiful tree of souls. I, I love that tree. Um, the tree is very willow-like, and I myself have always been attracted to willow trees. Let me see if I have the willow slide after the blue fogats. I do. Perfect. Okay. So I'm talking how it reminds you of a willow tree. It reminded me of a willow tree right away. You know, and I always did. I always loved the willow trees. Um, I say, and I myself have always been attracted to willow trees. Since I was a child, I love to watch weeping willows blowing in the wind outside my bedroom window as I drift off to sleep. I feel I have a very spiritual connection to it as well. And they say, yes, the tree holds a sacred connection on this planet and others. Eons ago, the elders tried to bring samples of the sacred tree to this planet, but it could not thrive without being genetically altered. Although much different from the rupee tree, the willows still retain some of its original properties. And then I say, what properties? And it says, it is one of many terrestrial beings that embody higher consciousness and wisdom. It is particularly beautiful, kind, and wise, and loved by many throughout the cosmos. And then I say, I'm seeing a vision of this tree sparkling and emitting light and glowing. 
a feeling of pure love and remembrance came over me. And they say, yes, an energy source of pure love, the true tree of knowledge that many have sought after. And so back before I move on from this uh, part, the ruby tree spelled R-O-O-B-I-E. And when I was doing the channel, I knew that it was definitely that specific uh, spelling. So right away, not right away, but I did Google it. I'm looking it up I'm like ruby tree, ruby tree. There's no tree called ruby tree or anything, but I did find a metaphysical bookstore named the ruby tree spelled that way, R-O-O-B-I-E. So they must have been. You know, I think it. I went back to try to find it again and it was gone or something. I could never find it again. I just found it that one time, which, you know, makes it even more magical, right? Okay, so that was pretty cool too. So R-O-O-B-I-E, the ruby tree, is the ancient starseed of this tree, of this magical tree that's featured in the James Cameron and also, you know, as our, our willow trees. Okay, we talked about the properties and then pure love. Okay, then I say, so back to the different races on human on earth different races of human on earth are they all star seeds from different planets and they say yes and there have been many more some are no longer present such as the blue people we have been speaking of after the last earth cleansing that ended the dinosaur reigns humans still alive lived in little pockets scattered throughout your world through interbreeding over many thousands of years, certain genetic traits came to be more pronounced and adapt to their particular environment. So again, very much altered from the original star seeds. Universal upgrades are continuing all the time as we have previously discussed. Yeah, they say, you know, they're always doing that. <laughs> so that's one tie-in. For number one is the blue skin, okay, from the Avatar movie. So they're saying there's lots of blue skin races. And then number two is the Tree of Souls, which they're saying is uh, one of a, a variation of this, uh, the, the uh, ruby tree, a ruby tree. So th those are two pretty cool things. I think that's the end of this group. So they ride around on these birds, you know, and they're connected in a soul way to these birds, which I'll get to in a minute more. But um they're not the only race that rides around on birds and stuff too. So I got to tell this story. So here it is. Uh, this is, I, I live in Ohio and years and years ago, we went camp. I was in a band and we all went camping together. I'm not sure where, but it looked something like this. We were, you know, in this, uh, these are these old things that were from glaciers, you know, these deep, these rivers at the bottom of these deep canyons on the side, like, so it's like this high. And we're down here, like we're about the size of this little rock here. And there's these huge, you know, canyons and stuff on either side. I think I have another picture that's better. I think the next one is better. Yeah. Yeah. It was very similar to this exact scene, except this right-hand side. I'm pointing with my finger. You can't see. This right-hand side was just like the other side. So there was no way we could get off and go on shore at this particular passage that we're going through right so it was a group of us and you know there was a couple few people in each cat in each canoe we were canoeing down this river and again both sides had these tall mountainous you know whatever you would call it cliff ridges kind of thing so we couldn't get out of couldn't just get out you know you just, just go so we're going down and we of course it was we were young we were partying everybody was partying and what somebody I'm way up here. You can see my hand is me and my partner, my boyfriend at the time. We're up here and we're about to turn the corner, go around this. It's just like this kind of we're going around this corner and they're about maybe back here. And some of the other people. <clears throat> One second, I just need a drink of water real quick. Oh, frog in my throat. So anyways, they fall out of the canoe because everybody's drunk and whatever. You know, we're partying and all kinds of stuff. And everybody's laughing and we're trying to pull it. They're going, oh, we got a good, good. They had the toilet paper, like save the toilet paper. I remember that, you know, when they were trying, everybody was laughing and trying to pull all their stuff out of the canoe and tip it back over. And we were about to go around the corner. And when we went around the corner, I saw this gigantic black bird. I mean, huge. It could have picked us up and carried us away. And I was just so, uh, I, like, I was speechless. I was so startled by what I was seeing. I was like, I, I, I couldn't even talk. And, um, but of course, then oh, all this commotion broke loose back here. And, and then, of course, we turned around and went back. And I was kind of, so then we got them back in the boat or whatever happened in the canoe. And we, we start heading back up there. And I was scared. I didn't say anything because I was like, they're going to think I'm crazy. And we went on the corner and there was no giant bird. But I mean, this thing. I was so freaked out. This thing could have carried us away. And then 
years later, because that was probably like in the 70s or two. That was definitely like in the late 70s. I was just a teenager. And um, years later, I found out about the Thunderbirds. It's a Native American, um, well, that people consider it a myth, you know, but it's a legend, a Native American legend, you could say. Here's some picture, and I wish I would have grabbed the thing with it, but, you know, I don't know if this is an actual bird they found because it seems to be in some museum. But this is one of the fav uh, famous pictures of the Thunderbirds, you know, but it's all throughout. And here's one, too. I thought I grabbed this one. It's a gorgeous art, too, but they've got it lifting a whale, you know, that, that they this thing is so big that it could lift a whale, right? And here's some more, you know, it's on totem poles, it's on all kinds of stuff. So uh, was that in book three? I think that's in book three. Yeah, the Thunderbirds. So this is in book three. I finally asked about that Thunderbird thing. So here's what they said. So I asked, well, what was that? Was it a figment of my imagination? And they say, not in the least. <laughs> a brush up against another dimension, another portal of time, a link to the distant past in the present moment. Layers of time and space, layers upon layers, dimensions upon dimensions, converging in and out of time-space coordinates. Their imprint on the land, a memory, a resonance. All time happening simultaneously, as you already know. The trees are of another dimensional resonance and engage with, multiple, with multiplicity of occurrences in the multiverse. The trees are present in your reality and in the reality of that bird as well. There are millions upon millions of dimensional engagements occurring all around you at any given juncture. So then I'm asking, is there any particular reason I saw that bird that day? Was there a message or meaning attached to it? And they say, there are many connections that can be made. Some you are able to comprehend and many more that are beyond your comprehension. They say that a lot. <laughs> it's just over your head, you know. <laughs> Okay, then I say, well, such as, and they say, beyond what can be perceived by the unawakened, another existence where you are joined together in flight. Here it comes. So. And so then I say, I'm getting a vision of a boy who reminds me of Mogwai of from the Jungle Book. He is riding on the back of one of those giant birds. I assume I am the boy. And they say, yes, in another incarnational expression, you rode upon and were deeply connected to the and I couldn't get the word I put Amosuri or Ambenasi were the two th almost creatures. It's a, so it's either Amosuri or Abenasi, but it begins with an A. And I say, well, was this on Earth? And they say, yes, another expression of Earth. And I say, well, what does that mean? And they say, there are many expressions of Earth layered on top of each other in multidimensional layers. And I say, well, did the birds see me as well that day? And they say, yes the kindred spirit from another time. And I say, so what was it coming to bring me a message or something? And then they say, again, there are many. The location was key. This is the place you traveled often with this companion. There is an energetic resonance, as we mentioned previously. So in another lifetime, I was on top of that bird flying in that exact same valley. So pretty cool, right? And then they say uh, the location was the key. And then I say, well, what about the Thunderbird legend? Is this the same collective memory of when we rode atop these birds? And they say, not in every case. There have been many species of bird of that stature on your planet. So of that stature meaning that big. I mean, this thing was giant. Okay. And then they say, they seem to be spotted around the Ohio Valley. Is that their migration route? Because that's where we were, Ohio Valley. And they say, such creatures reside all around the world. The area is where they lived in cooperation with humans, as was shown in your vision. So that's where they let us ride them, you know, in cooperation, like the Navi are riding on their birds. And then I say, so uh, that was not always the case, working with humans. And they say, not at all. In some cases, humans were seen as fodder for the creatures. The relationships between your tribe and the creatures was unique to that area at that time. Fodder meaning food. <laughs> they would just eat it. I mean, that's when I first saw it. Oh, my God, that thing could take us carries away, you know. And then uh, so they have, uh, at that time, there were other times in history where similar connections were made. This type of relationship is also present in other dimensional habitats in other planetary systems. The group that settled here, there brought this genetic code along with them and implemented it on the Earth plane, as it had been on their home planet. 
Yeah, so pretty cool. Now that's there's that's not all because there's even more. All right, so I have on the screen here another instance that came through of in the channeling that's even more similar to the uh, the Navi kind of thing here. So here's this hair on right, and it comes by me all the time when I'm channeling. I have several pictures of it here. He's, he's always seems to be around. There's one of its, you know, in the lake. That might not even be the same one, but there's always seems to be herons around. Okay, here's what I wrote. There's a heron who stands nearby on most days that I come to this particular spot. I feel like I've always had a bond with herons. And then I talk about some, you know, different things about the herons we don't need to go into really uh, right now. But I wanted to ask if there is a deeper meaning to the heron connection. And then they say, the creature before you is the same genetic seeding as the creature you were very close with. And then I'm get, I say, I'm getting a vision of riding atop a giant heron type of bird. It almost reminds me of the movie The Avatar again. Yeah, so this is a couple, three years later that this comes up again, right? And they say, yes, the author has brought through his own soul memory and has been mentioned, as has been mentioned before. So they're talking about, you know, James Cameron. He did have a soul memory from that, you know, incarnation, some kind of incarnation like that. And then uh, I say, this is the second time you've shown me a life where the human is riding on a bird. And they and I say, this is one is different than the Thunderbird vision, which was virtually just like Earth and the river valley that we were all in. The, the, the vision here does not appear to be earthly. Lots of blues, almost like the art of Roger Dean, who illustrated the Yes albums, or even similar to the Navi in the Avatar movies again. And they say, yes, there are many incarnational experiences where humans ride atop winged creatures. It is not so strange as it seems. Consider the relationships with humans and horses in your dimensional experience. It is a similar connection. The bond is deep and strong as one is joined to its avian companion for life in most cases. So this is getting into some really cool stuff, right? So I say, so I used to ride atop a giant heron type bird in another lifetime. Ha, what a trip. <laughs> and they say, yes, it is true. And soar in circular movements, as was presented on the beach. It was meant to awaken your soul connection memory. Yeah, because the, the story I told in the beginning that I sort of skipped was it was flying in a big circle. Yeah. Uh, and I say, and it did. I realized it was something magical. So the heron still hangs around today. For what reason, I'm asking. And they say there is a bond a promise of protection that is still present. A small portion of the larger Heron collected, collective is being expressed by the creature you see before you. A reminder of your bond, a dimensional space where you ride high on the waves of delight. The realm, this realm of existence is not as dense as your 3D reality. And then I'm saying, well, I'm getting a sense of it. The atmosphere does seem sort of thick, even like water somewhat. And they say, yes, there are multitudes of planetary atmospheres, each conducive to the life form it yields. So I ask, what was life like in this realm? Much time is spent in frolic and play as food and natural resources are all in abundance. They live in harmony with the natural world, therefore all flourish as is intended. Let's read that again. They live in harmony with the natural world, therefore all flourish as was intended. So they have time for fun stuff. Okay, there are games where riders such as yourself demonstrate riding skills through obstacle courses of sorts. And then I'm saying, I'm getting a vision of it. It almost reminds me of the games from the Harry Potter stories. It did, it reminded me of that a lot. So there's another possible, you know, psychic past life connection through Harry Potter authoress. Uh, and, but instead of flying around on birds, they're flying around on brooms, but it was similar, like, like Quidditch, right? Is that the game? So I say, yeah, it almost reminds me of the game from the Harry Potter stories where they fly around on broomsticks. I also see them diving underwater and coming back up. This is the vision you know, of, of the heron birds. And it says, yes, it is all done with fun and glee, void of aggression that is the fuel for many of your sporting games. Let's read that again. Yes, it is all done with fun and glee, void of aggression that is the fuel for many of your sporting games. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> I say, well, I feel that. There's a lot of joy and happiness all around. Uh, there is a sense of competition, but it is more of the dynamic that I had with my brother growing up. We always spurred each other on through healthy competition. 
So is he there as well? And they say, yes, indeed. And that sense of healthy competition, as you called it, is a byproduct of that incarnational experience. Yeah. Like me and my brother, you know, we always were just everything. You know, we played all every kind of sport you can imagine. Softball, tennis. We played tennis all, all the time. But even like at pool, as we were adults, we'd still play pool because our family had the bar, you know, billiard pool. You know, if he made some great shot, I wouldn't get pissed or vice versa. I'd be like, oh, dude, how'd you do that? Oh, I got to, you know, we get excited and, then, and that would spur me on to try to make that shot or vice versa. So that's what I mean by that. You know, not some people like you play pool with people, for instance, and they get all pissed off if you beat them or they may you make a good shot. Yeah, they're not happy. You know, it's like, dude, I can't believe you did that. Well, let me try, you know, more like that kind of energy, you know. OK, so they say, yeah, he was there, too. And that's how we brought that competition different kind of competition that's positive into this incarnation so then i say it's interesting to me that although i created those ceramic pieces years ago that strongly resemble the nali and avatar or navi and avatar these writers look nothing like that they're almost more like the flying monkeys uh from the wizard of oz they seem to be wearing some sort of fancy colorful masks reminiscent of the culture of india uh, and I'm getting a clear picture in my mind with another one, and he's looking at me dead in the face. They might be more like a cat or a fox face under that mask. There is no creature that is an exact genetic match in your existence. Although somewhat hairier than your human inhabitants, they are closer to you genetically than you can imagine. Okay, I want to I want to pull up. I don't know if I have more pictures of the hair on here, but I, I want to pull up also. Oh, there, that's a good. I love that one. He's posing for me. He's totally posing for me. Poser. <laughs> Let's find the writers. Yeah, is this the right one? The writers. Yeah. Okay, so I start out with the monkeys. Yeah, showing those monkeys. Yeah, so initially, in my mind's eye, I, I, and I hadn't, seen, I hadn't seen the Wizard of Oz in I don't know how many years, but I thought they reminded me of them. But when I see this picture, not, not so much, not really. A little bit, a little bit that way. Uh, more than I was thinking, maybe more like a monkey wearing an organ grinder suit. But, you know, they were wearing these elaborate masks like this, very colorful, beautiful, like Mardi Gras mask. And then finally, I, I did go ahead and sketch the picture when the one was looking me dead in the face. It looked kind of like this. And so these they do have some kind of ears like a cat or a fox, and they are kind of hairy, but they they're like, like they're saying they're humanoid and they definitely were intelligent. Well, I guess all animals are intelligent. So that's up for debate. But I put these colorful masks and they're sort of hairy, like a monkey, maybe, but with cat, cat or fox ears, but then humanoid. And, you know, I remember this vision of that one looking me in the face there. And I was just like, uh, we were buds. Whoever that was, we knew each other. Like we were maybe even teammates or something like that. And, you know, and we were riding on, on top of these sort of hair on uh, type of birds, you know. So again, the tie into the avatar is the riding of the birds, not necessarily. They weren't blue skin. They were kind of hairy looking, whatever, you know, very different. And it felt tiny, like, like the flying monkeys. Like these guys are super tall. You know, these guys are little, little tiny people. Almost pig, the word pygmy wants to come to mind. Okay, so then I'm asking, here's some more. Um, so do everybody, does everybody uh, ride these birds in that society? Yes, but not to the degree that you engage. So I was an enthusiast, I guess. Just as everybody in your society may ride a horse if they so choose, but not all would become experts. So I was sort of an expert, yeah. So these masks we're wearing, is this part of the show, like a circus or something? And they say, it is not all fun and games as a circus. A highly skilled fighter pilot might be a closer comparison, but without the aggression. So there it is again, without the aggression. Because we were like, shoo, diving into the water and shoo, coming back up. You know, it's almost like watching, like, if you you have the Blue Angels come to your town, how they do all those aerial, shoo, you know, acrobatic kind of things. It was kind of like that. Uh, so yeah, so they say w without the aggression, and then I'm saying, well, it's see I'm kind of seeing the scene in, in my mind's eye, and I'm writing down a few things. I say, well, it seems like not all the people are hairy. Some look more humanoid. <laughs> it was kind of bothering. We were like hairy. It was kind of weird. And it says, you are viewing a gathering of different races at the festival of lights. Each culture brings some of their unique magic to share with the collective. All rejoice in the beauty of one another. It is void of com competitive nature. 
I like that. Each culture brings some of their unique magic to share with the collective. All rejoice in the beauty of one another. It is void of the competitive nature. So I like that a lot. Okay, then they, I'm saying the creatures are that we're riding on seem to be sort of dragon-like. Are the herons genetically related to dragons? And they say a distant relative. The creatures of this society are very close relative to the one you call heron. Okay, then I, a little side note, I didn't know this. After this session, I went to look up Roger Dean's art and came across an article about he, how he's suing James Cameron. Apparently he accused him of copying his art for the backdrops of the Avatar movie. I never heard anything about this until right at this moment. If only they knew that they are both probably remembering another incarnation in a different realm, which I do believe is true. They're both like I was and probably a lot of you. Maybe you don't have that remembrance, but when you see it, maybe you can't pull it out of your own, um, you know, psychic or higher self or whatever, your own unconscious mind. But then when you see it on the screen, you know, like in the case of the Avatar, that's why it was such a big hit and everybody loves it because many of us have had these incarnations, you know, in these realms. And even like, I was so sure that it was the same realm because of headband and everything. That first part, I think I probably lost that folder. I don't think I could pull it up again. Yeah, yeah I can, I can, blue statues. Um, you know, when I saw that, the first, when I saw that movie, I was just like, that's, ex I felt like it was exactly the same. But then they said, no, it's not really. It's just another, there's a lot of them. You know, we're so narrow-minded in our, in our view of, uh, you know, reality, I guess, you know, of, uh, of what's possible or whatever, you know, if there's no blue beings or blue, there's, what do you say, thousands of blue beings all over the place. But very similar with the headband, that would be back more to the first ones, right? she's wearing that when i saw that thing with the headband and then it's just like oh my god that is just the same you know it definitely sparked something major same in me you know so so that's a couple of ways and it's a you know if you're if you're just a fan of the movie and watching this and you know it's a little too far up there for you then maybe it's just something to resonate on but if you are interested in um you know some et other races and stuff that really aren't always discussed you know a lot of them aren't discussed everybody talks about the pleiadians and this and that you know so there's a quite and if you're interested in any of that because there is quite a bit of it in in all the books those are just a few that i pulled out because i wanted to um you know, I wanted to point out the similarities, you know, be, between these races uh, in the movie Avatar and, and why and offer up a suggestion as why maybe, you know, it's so popular. But hey, if you are into this kind of far out stuff and you want to hear more about it, I've got written three books on it. So they're available. They're available uh, on Audible. If you're a member of, you can try Audible for free and listen for free. Or if you're a member, you can listen for free. And they're also in the camp or the it's Kindle Lending Library where you can read for free as well too. So, and or you could just buy your own copy on Amazon. All three are out. And I'm I'm working as I'm recording this video. I'm currently working on the fourth book too. So, there doesn't seem to be any end in sight to the channeled books. Um, so, uh, check it out if you're interested. And thanks for tuning in today. Uh, remember, you are all love and beauty incarnate, and we'll talk again soon.